Hello and welcome back to The Fall of the Roman Empire. It's Nick Holmes and this is episode 78 called Next Stop Carthage. In the last episode, we heard how the Nika riots left the heart of Constantinople a burnt-out wreck, with 30,000 dead on the streets. The anonymous author of the Pascal Chronicle described the shocked silence in the city on the day after the riots were crushed. Quote, And on the 20th of January, a Tuesday, all of Constantinople was quiet and no one dared to go out, but only the shops which provided food and drink for needy people were open and business remained untransacted and Constantinople was without commerce for a number of days, end quote. Justinian had survived, but only just, and only thanks to Theodora and Belisarius. Without them, he would almost certainly have fled the capital and been deposed, relegating his reign to a footnote in the history books. Now he was in a powerful position. Belisarius had given him a significant victory. His two major rivals for the purple, Anastasius's nephews, Hypatius and Pompeius, were both dead. The Green faction, containing Justinian's most vocal critics, was crushed. It had almost certainly suffered the majority of the 30,000 casualties. The Blue faction was cowed and no doubt regretting it had risen against its erstwhile benefactor. As for the rebellious senators, although we have frustratingly little information about them, we know 18 were exiled and their property confiscated. Although Justinian had triumphed in the Nika riots, he refrained from a large-scale purge of the Senate, even those members of the Palace Guard who'd obstructed Belisarius's route into the Hippodrome to arrest Hypatius were not publicly punished, although I doubt their career prospects were helped. Instead, for once in his reign, Justinian held back from brutally imposing his will and was even willing to make concessions. For example, he waited several months before reinstating his favourites, who he dismissed at the mob's request. John the Cappadocian was only returned to his position as chief finance minister in October 532, and Tribonian wasn't reinstated until November 533. His obsessive lawmaking stopped. He issued no new laws until October, except for one rescinding an earlier instruction to reduce the bread rations to the poor of the city. Yet another concession designed to curry favour with the mob. Indeed, in 533, a year after the riots, he seems to have conducted a charm offensive by granting posthumous pardons to Hypatius and Pompeius. Hypatius was given his own small cenotaph, bearing an inscription that read, quote, I am the tomb of Hypatius, but small as I am, I make no claim to cover the body of so great a champion of the Romans, end quote. In due course, he even restored the confiscated property of both Hypatius and Pompeius to their children and relatives, and according to Procopius, he did the same for the 18 exiled senators. Another surprising concession was that extended to the Monophysites. As we heard in episode 73, before he became emperor, Justinian had carved an identity for himself as a staunch Chalcedonian and supporter of the Pope's views. This stance undoubtedly helped him become emperor in the fiercely Chalcedonian city of Constantinople. But it hadn't helped him in the Nika riots, when most of the rioters were Chalcedonian, but still opposed him. So, in 532, perhaps in an attempt to gain support in the eastern provinces to counter his soured relations in Constantinople, he sought to make concessions to the Monophysites by offering a watered-down version of the Council of Chalcedon's ruling that Christ was both divine and human simultaneously, as opposed to the Monophysite view he was only divine. This was, in effect the same sort of compromise the Emperor Zeno had tried to secure with the Henoticon. Although the Monophysite bishops were ready to accept this point of doctrine, which would have marked quite a victory for Justinian, they also wanted to reinstate 55 anti-Chalcedonian bishops who Justinian's uncle, the Emperor Justin, had exiled. Justinian couldn't agree to this, 
And in the end, no compromise was agreed. The conversations of 532, as they became known, remained merely conversations. Justinian had achieved nothing. But this didn't stop him from looking to religion to help heal the wounds of the Nika riots. He tried to foster a narrative that the uprising in the associated death and destruction were a punishment from God for the empire's sinfulness, akin to a natural disaster. This conveniently distanced the true cause of the riots, which was, of course, dissatisfaction with him. Instead, Justinian promoted himself as the empire's healer, its chief priest petitioning God to grant forgiveness to a sinful people. His rebuilding of Constantinople was initiated with the sense of a religious mission. His top priority was to rebuild the Church of Hagia Sophia, the city's effective cathedral, more splendidly than it was before, as a celebration of God's power and an entreaty for divine protection. The chronicler John Lydus described Justinian's plan for Constantinople as akin to building heaven on earth, quote, just as if the Creator were again calling forth the universe into light out of the formless matter by the mere power of his volition, end quote. And Justinian's building programme exceeded all expectations. In just five years and ten months, Hagia Sophia was built on a staggering scale and with such care and attention that it survived to this day, largely intact, to dominate modern Istanbul. Two architects, Anthemius of Tral and Isidore of Miletus, were given the commission for the new building. Anthemius was a renowned mathematician, and it was his calculations that enabled a radical new church design. Instead of the traditional basilica structure with pitched roofs, widely used in churches in the late Roman Empire, such as the magnificent churches in Rome of St Peter and St Paul, Hagia Sophia had an enormous dome, more similar to the classical Roman pantheon. Domes thereafter became the new fashion in the Eastern Roman Empire and, of course, proved to be hugely influential in later centuries on Islamic mosques and Russian Orthodox churches. Even before Hagia Sophia was built, Justinian had experimented with a mini-dome in the Church of St. Sergius and Bacchus in Constantinople, which still stands today. But the dome of Hagia Sophia was breathtakingly large. The whole building was huge, some 90 metres long and 70 metres wide, probably the largest in the world at that time. And the scale and height of the dome remained unsurpassed for a thousand years until the Renaissance version of St Peter's in Rome was built in the 16th century. When Justinian dedicated the building on the 27th of December 537, he said to have exclaimed, O Solomon, I have outdone thee, in reference to the Grand Temple Solomon built at Jerusalem. Hagia Sophia immediately became synonymous not just with Justinian, but with the power and authority of the Eastern Roman Empire. Its spacious interior with the light radiating through its topmost windows like a celestial beam, and its great beauty enhanced by sheets of wall-to-wall -wall mosaics, together with its amazing acoustics, conspired to make it the vision of heaven on earth Justinian had hoped to create. Indeed, it was so breathtaking that in the 10th century, Viking visitors from the newly founded Principality of Kiev believed they'd actually been to heaven when they entered the church and immediately converted to Christianity. Justinian's rebuilding project didn't stop there. From 532 until 543, during the era of reconquest in North Africa and Italy, he carried on building. 32 more churches were constructed, six hospices, and a host of public buildings were restored, as well as new harbours dug for the city. 
After Hagia Sophia, the most impressive surviving church of Justinian's is the domed basilica church of Hagia Irene, close to Hagia Sophia in modern Istanbul, but often ignored by tourists in preference for its more splendid sibling. In addition, there still exists the spectacular remains of an enormous water system built by Justinian, again close to Hagia Sophia, and today called the Basilica System, or in Turkish the Yerebatan Sarai, which is extremely well preserved and contains hundreds of ancient columns collected from pagan temples. It's now one of the top tourist attractions in modern Istanbul and a favourite location for many films, including the James Bond from Russia with Love. Most of Justinian's other buildings have been lost over the centuries, including a restored Church of the Holy Apostles, which was Constantine's largest church and which was damaged in the riots and dozens of other smaller churches, as well as the restored baths of Zeusippus and the main entrance to the imperial palace called the Chalke, or Bronze Gate, which was, in effect, a colossal triumphal arch. Perhaps the most striking monument of all was situated in the Augusteon Square, which stood flanked by Hagia Sophia, the baths of Zeusippus and the Chalke Gate. This was the heart of the city, a bit like Trafalgar Square in London. And in 543, Justinian built what would have been the most striking monument of all, an enormous column with a bronze statue of himself on horseback. Unfortunately, the Turks pulled this down at some point after 1453, but our records of it are good, and at some 70 metres tall, it would have towered over even Hagia Sophia itself. Justinian's statue faced east, with one hand holding a globe with a cross upon it, and the other stretched out, according to Procopius, as if he was commanding the world to stop and fall at his feet. By putting himself at the heart of both this vast rebuilding program and imbuing it with a Christian message, Justinian behaved similarly to the Emperor Constantine. Indeed, in the 530s, the city of Constantinople, in effect, moved from being Constantine's city to Justinian's, and so it would remain until it fell to the Turks in 1453. But now we need to return to the year 532, when this rebuilding project was but a glint in Justinian's eye. For in that year he was still under intense pressure, and unsure how long his regime would last. In his new conciliatory mood, he made his biggest concession of all, and arguably the one that was least justified, a humiliating peace with Persia. The origins of this lay with the Shah Kavad's death in April 531. Because of this, the Persians had broken off their offensive directed principally against Martyropolis. Kavad's death sparked a period of instability in Persian politics with his son and successor Khosroes facing opponents internally in much the same way that Justinian was challenged in the Nika riots. To concentrate on these domestic problems, Khosroes was willing to make peace with the Romans, and especially so since it transpired that Justinian was also dead desperate to end the Persian threat and stabilise his eastern frontier. Therefore, soon after the Nika riots in the spring of 532, the so-called endless peace was signed. But this wasn't an agreement between equals. Justinian paid Khosroes the enormous sum of £11,000 of gold to secure it, and handed over two forts the Romans had taken from the Persians in Armenia, Bolon and Pharangian. In addition, he agreed to demilitarise Dara, which the Emperor Anastasius had constructed as a major fortress opposite the Persian centre of military operations at Nisibis. So why did Justinian agree to these humiliating terms? £11,000 of gold was a huge sum, and over five times the annual subsidy Theodosius II agreed to pay Attila in 447. 
And that was when Attila had led his army to the very walls of Constantinople, although he hadn't attempted to besiege it. In contrast, in 532, the Persians and Romans were pretty evenly matched in terms of battles. Belisarius had won the Battle of Dara, but lost the subsequent one at Callinicum. Persian casualties had probably been higher than Roman during the course of the war, if Procopius's account is to be believed. The Romans had taken the two forts in Armenia, which Justinian agreed to hand back. Admittedly, the Persians seemed to have put together a larger army to attack Martyropolis than the Romans could field, but the city had held out and the Persian army had withdrawn. Justinian tried to hide behind the official line that the gold was payment for the Persian defences against the Huns in the Caucasus, an agreement long established to cover the joint cost of defending that region. But although we don't know the precise amount of gold the Romans paid the Persians in previous years for the Caucasus defences, it was clear to everyone this payment was far more than normal. Some historians have seen Justinian's enthusiasm for this piece as evidence he was already planning his wars of reconquest in the West and wanted to secure peace on the Eastern Front to free up troops. They argue it was worth the cost. This was certainly the view expressed by Justinian himself in later years. For example, in 536, in one of the laws he issued, he referred to his recent conquests as a plan to reconquer the lost Western Empire. Quote, We are inspired with the hope that God will grant us rule over the rest of what, subject to the ancient Romans, to the limits of both seas, they later lost by their neglect. End quote. But was this really just propaganda? I think so. I suggest it's very doubtful that in the dark days of 532, following the horror of the Nika riots, Justinian was harbouring grand plans of reconquest. Instead, it's much more likely his glorious Western campaign started with more modest objectives. And to analyse this, we need to look more closely at the situation within the Vandal Kingdom of Carthage. In 523, Hilderic ascended the throne, half Roman and half Vandal, the son of Geyseric's son, Huneric, and his wife, the Roman princess Eudocia. He represented the union of barbarian and Roman that his grandfather Geyseric had so ardently striven for in his lifetime. But Geyseric's dream that his grandson might become a future Western Roman emperor had come to nothing. And when Hilderic finally ascended the Vandal throne, he was an old man in his 60s. He pursued a policy of rapprochement with the Eastern Empire. This centred on healing the religious divide that was one of the most prominent features of the Vandal kingdom. For like the Goths in Italy, the Vandals had never renounced their Aryan faith. Conflict between the two churches was fairly constant during the first hundred years of the kingdom's life, but with Hilderic's ascension, there was a clear step towards religious toleration. The Catholic Church of North Africa was allowed to function without impediment and even to hold its first council in two generations in Carthage in 525. Hilderic's more lenient religious stance was perhaps partly out of respect for his mother's faith, but probably more because he wished to oppose the Ostrogothic Kingdom of Italy, which, under Theodoric's rule, had become the most powerful barbarian kingdom in the West. To counter Theodoric's growing power, he sought an alliance with Constantinople and established a good relationship with Justinian. But luck was not on his side. During the 520s, the indigenous nomadic Berber tribes on the kingdom's southern borders had been growing in size, cooperating better and proving to be a more formidable opponent to the Vandals than ever before. 
Hilderic was not a strong military leader and he was too old to lead his troops into battle. And in late 529 or early 530, the Vandal army suffered a serious defeat in the province of Biacenza. This provoked a rebellion against Hilderic in 530 by his younger royal cousin Gelimer, who renewed the persecution of the Catholic Church. Not surprisingly, Justinian was very unhappy with this turn of events. His relationship with Hilderic had been politically valuable, and there seems to have been a genuine friendship between the two. So he immediately dispatched messengers to Carthage to demand Hilderic's reinstatement. Gelimer ignored the request. He then inflamed the situation by replying to a second request from Justinian, telling him to mind his own business and focus instead on managing his own realm. This message arrived shortly after the Nika riots and seems to have stung Justinian. Procopius says it was then that he conceived his idea to make a full attack on the Vandal state. Quote, the emperor, upon receiving the letter, having been angry with Gelimer even before then, was now still more eager to punish him, and it seemed to him best to put an end to the Persian War as soon as possible, and then to make an expedition to Libya, as Procopius called the Vandal Kingdom, and since he was quick at forming a plan and prompt in carrying out his decisions, Belisarius, the general of the East, was summoned and came to him immediately, end quote. But I suggest this wasn't the only thing that made up Justinian's mind to attack Carthage. I think there was a host of other reasons which led to this decision. One was the enormous wealth said to exist in Carthage, amassed from the sack of Rome in 455, and decades of prosperous trade under Vandal rule. The other was the attraction of a religious crusade. Procopius says Justinian was keen to display his piety by punishing the Arian Vandals for their persecution of the Catholic Church in North Africa. According to one source, Constantinople had been gripped by the story that Gelimer had ripped out the tongues of Catholic priests and banished them to Constantinople, where they had miraculously recovered the power of speech. Procopius, with his dry humour, remarked that the miracle had only lasted until the African bishops were discovered consorting with prostitutes in the imperial capital, whereupon they lost their power of speech again. But no one else shared Justinian's enthusiasm to attack the Vandals. The idea shocked the Senate, and they reminded Justinian of the disastrous outcome of the expedition in 468. The army was similarly terrified by the prospect of a major new war in a distant foreign land, and particularly irked by the idea of a sea journey just as the army in 468 had been. To quote Procopius again, the soldiers also who recently returned from a long hard war, i.e. against the Persians, and had not yet tasted to the full the blessings of home, were in despair because they were being led into a naval expedition, a thing they were ignorant about, and because they would be sent from the eastern front to the west in order to risk their lives against vandals and moors. End quote. Justinian's trusted First Minister John the Cappadocian, recently restored to office, was the most vocal critic. He said the risks far outweighed the rewards and pointed out with good strategic understanding that victory in North Africa would only lead to war with the Ostrogoths in Italy. Procopius says Justinian was swayed by John against the expedition until a bishop arrived at the palace determined to see the emperor. He explained he'd had a vision in which God had promised the Romans victory if Justinian would be bold enough to undertake the mission. But in reality, Justinian was probably more influenced by two unexpected pieces of good news received over the winter of 532-33. to 
First, at the extreme eastern end of the Vandal Kingdom in Tripolitania, i.e. modern Libya, a native African Roman nobleman named Pudentius revolted against Gelimer and asked for support from Constantinople. Since there were very few Vandals settled in that region, this didn't involve a meaningful military confrontation, but it provided Justinian with a convenient pretext to send troops to protect the local Roman population. Then, much more significantly, at the extreme northern end of the Vandal domain this time, another revolt erupted, led by the governor of Sardinia, a Goth by birth, who Gelimer had entrusted with the rule of the island. Like Pudentius, he also asked Justinian for help. With two rebellions now distracting the Vandals, the prospects for victory in North Africa suddenly looked much better. However, I still feel the major impetus driving Justinian was his wish to distract attention from the failures of his reign so far, i.e. the shocking Nika riots and the humiliating peace with Persia. He was hoping victory in North Africa, even if it was only to reinstate Hilderic, would give his prestige a much-needed boost. But, as John the Cappadocian had warned him, the risks were enormous, so Justinian turned to Mr Fixit, the man who'd saved him once already by crushing the Nika riots, and who he now desperately hoped could deliver another miracle. That man was, of course, Belisarius. And that ends this episode. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it. And in the next episode, which will be in two weeks' time on the 2nd of March, we'll continue with the extraordinary story of Justinian and Belisarius. And in the meantime, please do leave a review if you like the podcast, and do also check out my website, nickholmesauthor.com. Link in the show notes to find maps, blogs, and a free ebook. Thanks for listening and see you next time. <music>